as I'm praying, God begins to speak to me. And he's convicting my conscience about all that I'm doing. The woman I was sleeping with, the woman I was living with. And then you think you're going to get your wife back like that? You must be out your mind. That's not how this works. And often when we are playing the field and we're living in our flesh, we make dumb decisions because we are blind. Sin blinds us. We are walking in darkness when we're walking in sin. And we think that we can bring some benefit to ourselves while doing what we know we shouldn't do. We're foolish. So here's the extended version of one sure way in which to find a mate. The year was 2019. Look, your boy was tripping. I was doing all kind of stuff from smoking weed, the occasional crack, cocaine, alcohol, you name it. I was a mess. I was doing all kind of crazy stuff. And for 13 years, my wife at the time put up with my foolishness. Well, the levee always eventually breaks. And she had enough. And she put my yellow tail out. Yes, she did. And you know, we had to go through a process in order to get a divorce. The state of Louisiana where we live requires that two individuals who had been married, in order for them to be rewarded a divorce, have to be able to live separately from one another underneath two different addresses before the state of Louisiana rewards you a divorce, but you'd have to be living on your own for at least a year. And I am fathom that this was perhaps so that you could be sure that this is really what you wanted to do. Well, we were in that year stage. I would say we were probably within the ninth or 10th month of that year of separation. I had moved around a little bit. I'd even left the state of Louisiana for some time and found myself in some other places, just finding myself, looking for myself. I moved back home with my mom. Uh, that didn't work uh, for very long. Then I ended up in Alabama in certain places. That didn't work out very long. I began to miss my children. And so I moved back to Louisiana. You know, I wanted to do right. I've always known since the age of nine that I was called to do great things for God. Then at the age of 18, God confirmed it by giving me a dream. And in another message, I'll share that dream with you. But basically, I knew that I was called to do something for God. Well, after having gotten married, I became promiscuous not very long after. I started drinking and smoking again. I started doing a whole lot of crazy things that I knew I shouldn't do. And it began to put a strain on my marriage. And like I said, for 13 years, my wife at the time put up with my foolishness. But when the levee broke, she had enough and she put me out. Now look, when I got put out initially, I had nowhere to go. And that's part of why you heard me say I was traveling all around the different states, et cetera, et cetera. I stayed with my mom for a little while. But when I came back to the state of Louisiana trying to make things right with my uh, wife at the time, I ended up staying with a pastor friend of mine who let me stay in a room in the back of his home. I started working hard. I got two jobs. I started going to the gym. This is right before COVID. I started working out a lot. And uh, my mind was focused and I was determined I was going to get my wife back. Well, 13 years of dumb decisions pretty much brought a end to that love that my wife had for me. And unfortunately, she got caught up in a situation. That's all I'm going to say. That's her business. It ain't yours. I'm only sharing it because it's part of my testimony, but I won't go into full detail. I remember trying to get my wife back. And uh, I would go over to the house and I would cry, I would beg, I would sit on the couch and hold her hand, I would make promises, look, I'll do this, I'll do that, you know, I'll submit, I'll do this, I'll do that. Homegirl wasn't having it. She had had enough. And for those of you that out there are married, I hope that you're listening, I hope you pay attention to the fact that men and women, although they love you, even if they're Christians, they have a limit. They can't handle but so much. You can't handle but so much. So don't expect to put somebody through living hell and then at the end when you're ready to sober up and live right, that they're just going to fly right and just take everything because, hey, it's hard to do. Well, that was the situation. Simply because I could not afford to rent my own apartment or my own home, I went on Craigslist and I found an ad where a lady was renting a room out of her home. And I rented this room for about $350 a month. Now, mind you, one of the issues outside of my promiscuity, which was the perhaps the main reason 
why my wife at the time put me out and had enough was I had this drug habit and I told y'all about that already. Well, look, crack, cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, pills, I was doing it all. And with that money, I should have been building up our home, taking care of my wife and my two children. Well, I was getting high. And so that habit only grew as a result of me now not having no accountability. I can go where I want to, be there as long as I want to. I ain't got to answer to nobody about my money. But I didn't have enough discipline to slow down so that I could rent at least my own apartment or at least my own home. So I was renting a room out of someone's home. About three fifty a month was the was the fee, and I was still doing a whole lot of drugs. You think if I was doing the drugs when I was married or when I was living with my wife at the time, it only got worse once I got by myself. And cocaine, I would have all night binges, watching pornography, just doing it all. Yet I knew still that God had called me. Remember, I told you that at eighteen I had a dream. That never left me. However, I was running from it, sort of like Jonah. I didn't want to stop and slow down long enough for God to fully use me. And although I was doing social media ministry or I was a content creator on Facebook, God could never really bless the work because I was undecided. I was divided in between my flesh and in between Christ. And God can't bless your mess. So for about 12 years up to this point, I had been doing ministry, but it really wasn't going anywhere. People would call me and ask me to come and preach at their church. Weeks would go by and I'd never hear from them. And it would be discouraging, but I knew what the reasons were. I wasn't faithful. So I'm living in this woman's home. I'm renting out and I'm working two jobs. I'm working at the mall. I'm working at a call center in Louisiana, but I'm still doing drugs. I'm still doing certain things. However, I never stopped praying and that is truly a key for God to be able to come into your life and do things when you are not yourself able now let me be clear we ain't never able I don't care what it is God says without me you can't do nothing and so I was at least a little wise enough to say Lord here I am I'm smoking I'm drinking I'm doing all these drugs I don't want to stop I'm sleeping with different women I don't want to stop I need your help I kept on praying well there was a lady at church she was a bit older than I and she had a weight problem and I'm gonna be honest and say that I was not physically attracted to her at all but I decided one night to go and hang out with her at her place and we watched a few movies I enjoyed her company and one thing led to the next. And after about two weeks, I looked up and I'm still in the house. <laughs> it was funny. I hadn't even went back to the place where my clothes were at this home that I was renting out. And uh, after another two weeks, four weeks went by, I got this idea. I said, you know what? She's not running me off. She's not telling me to leave. Why don't I just save this $350 a month and move in with her? And that's exactly what I did. And from there on, I say for about the next two or three months, we hung out all the time. Now, I am grateful to say that there was no sex involved between this woman and I. However, there were things that were still going on that I knew were wrong. And remember, I was still legally married. Again, I told you that the state of Louisiana requires that you be living separately in two different addresses for at least a year before they reward you in a divorce. Well, that year was almost up and I was living with this woman as if she was my wife, minus the sex. But the thing was, I still needed sex. I was still living by my flesh. I was not willing to live the way Christ wanted me to live. And so that year, I remember I went to the hospital. I had an issue with a wound on my foot. And while in the hospital, a janitor walks in and she was gorgeous. Now I could tell she was a little older than me. And by a little, really, she was at least 25 years older than me at that time, but she was fine. And uh, we got to talking while she would come in and clean my room. And I would compliment her as to how beautiful she was. One thing led to the next. We exchanged phone numbers. And I ended up having sex with this woman and more than once, more than twice. You know, the crazy thing about it was that uh, I was caught up in this love triangle. 
and neither one of the women knew about the other. Neither one of them knew what was going on with me. I was running the show. I was the puppet master. They were the puppets, if you will. And I don't say that to degrade them. What I'm saying is that I wasn't able to find women with self-esteem issues to such an extent that they wouldn't question what I was doing when I wasn't with them, right? So I enjoyed all of it. I was living with the one woman from church and sleeping with the other woman who I had met at the hospital. And I was still trying to get my wife back who was still legally married to me. However, we know already that we were headed towards that direction. Man, it was crazy. I would leave the house of the girl who I was living with, the church girl, and I would have the woman I was sleeping with come and pick me up at this other woman's house. I was balling like that. I was gangster like that. It didn't bother me. It didn't matter to me. I was running all the plays. I was calling all the audible. Well, God was still talking to me, and he let me to know, Andre, you're messing up. You're messing up. You're messing up. Look, you need to get yourself together. I kept on praying. I, I refused to stop praying. I refused. And, and, and some people may say, well, you're a hypocrite. What was you praying for? You were still drinking and smoking. You, you, you were still putting your penis in stuff. You were still doing this, this, that, and the third. And you, you're correct. But you have to know that without God, you ain't nothing. You stop praying, you really are in the arms of the devil. You stop praying, you are really falling victim to Satan now. I prayed because I knew I needed help. I knew I needed help. I knew I wasn't living right. As I'm praying, God begins to speak to me. And he's convicting my conscience about all that I'm doing. The woman I was sleeping with, the woman I was living with. And then you think you're going to get your wife back like that? You must be out your mind. That's not how this works. And often when we are playing the field and we're living in our flesh, we make dumb decisions because we are blind. Sin blinds us. We are walking in darkness when we're walking in sin. And we think that we can bring some benefit to ourselves while doing what we know we shouldn't do. We're foolish. So with all this going on, one day I fell to my knees. And I said, Lord, I really, really do need your help. I know that you've called me. You called me when I was nine. You confirmed it when I was 18. Lord, if you can still use me, help me. That was my prayer. And I prayed like that because I had lost my leg already up to this point. I was on the brink of losing my wife. I was smoking crack. I was drinking. I was doing so many things that I felt like God had said, well, I'm gonna hit the eject button on that plan. Ain't nothing I can do with him. Well, after I prayed that prayer, I remember I started hearing the voice of God even louder. And one day I woke up, rolled me up a blunt, I went to the gas station, got me a bag of ice. I left the house of the girl who I was living with and I headed on my way to work. I'm just about to light the blunt and enjoy my commute when someone pulls out into the intersection and totals my 2001 Chevy Suburban. Did not have a seatbelt on, so I busted my forehead on the bench. They knocked me out for at least two or three minutes. I came to the very first thing I heard from God was, You need to get yourself together. Let me back up a little bit. About two weeks before this accident, I told you that all of my multimedia ministry up to this point was done on Facebook. I hadn't gotten on YouTube quite yet. And so I would produce all of my presentations there on Facebook. And I was discouraged. Up to this point, it was about 12 years that I had been doing Facebook ministry. And I was about to let it go. I was about to deactivate my Facebook account. I was really, really, really tired. A feeling as if God was not looking down on me with favor. When it was really my fault, I wasn't living the way I needed to live. I wasn't faithful and I was not consistent. But I was still angry at God. And so I get on Facebook with the idea that I was going to deactivate my account and stop preaching altogether. So as I get on Facebook that particular day, remember this is two weeks before the accident. I'm scrolling through my news feed just one last time for old time's sake. And uh, I come across the image of a beautiful woman. And I'm saying, oh, wow, who's this? You know, I noticed we were friends, but I didn't know who she was. I couldn't remember how we had become friends. 
Um, and rather than jump in her inbox and start telling her how fine she was, you know, I was still married, number one. I was living with a woman, number two. I was sleeping with another woman, number three. I was still doing drugs and all these other things. I didn't have time to get caught up. But remember, I was praying. I was still praying, asking God to help me. And this was the day that I was getting on Facebook to deactivate my account. So when I saw this woman's photo, I said, wow, I left two emojis under her photo. I didn't say a word. I left a little googly eye emoji and I left the heart emoji. And I went about my business. I didn't say one thing to her. About a day or so later, I got a message in my inbox on Facebook. I guess that evening I didn't follow through with deactivating the page. I got sidetracked with other things. And I said, I'll just, you know, finish that later. And the next day I got a message from someone saying, thank you. Thank you for what? I, there was no dialogue between us. I didn't know who this person was. Like, thank you for what? Did you see a video I did or something? Did you, uh, were you blessed by it? And so I asked, I said, thank you for what? And she responded and says, you left the two emojis under my photo the other day. Then it refreshed my memory. It was like, oh yeah, the gorgeous lady whose photo I ran into. I said, well, you're welcome. Now immediately I could read her spirit because I have that spirit of discernment. It's one of my greatest gifts. And I could tell she was a good woman. I could tell that she was a Christian. And that meant a lot, but I got a lot going on myself. I, how am I going to engage this woman? What am I going to say to her? Because as soon as she know the truth, it's over, right? And on top of that, she was living out of town in another state. I'm in Louisiana and I got all this junk going on in my life. But when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, when you give your situation over to God and you begin to submit to him, he says that I will honor those who honor me, right? So I began to start talking to her just on Facebook. I didn't get a number. And I began to start enjoying the conversations. I remember one evening at the woman's house who I was living with, I'm on the back porch and I'm on Facebook Messenger talking to this woman. And we spoke for three hours on Facebook Messenger, just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I began to feel like, wow, this woman, She's special. She ain't just your ordinary woman. But I still got all this stuff going on. And uh, so what did I do? I lied. I lied to her and I said, well, hey, uh, I'm living with a roommate. He's a male. And uh, after about two weeks of that, right before the wreck, she started wanting to FaceTime me. She was smart. See, a lot of women will know that if they even will take the time to engage a man that's in another place so that they don't get catfished or so that they can perceive the truth about what's going on, they'll FaceTime you. They want to see you. They want to make sure you are who you say you are on your photos, on your, on your uh, 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 social media platform, right? And I don't blame them. I'm a guy. I do the same thing. And so uh, she would FaceTime me and I'd be at this woman's house. And I was afraid of this woman catching me. So I would say, well, look, you know, uh, it's late. I worked all day. I can only talk to you for just a few minutes. Really, I was trying to keep it a secret from the woman I was living with. Because, of course, if she find out I'm talking to another woman, she gonna put me out. And I ain't got nowhere to go. All I had was this 2001 Suburban. And I still had all my clothes and belongings pretty much in that Suburban. Although I was living with this woman for the past several months. I would never get too comfortable because I always knew that the, the time on my lease would come up soon, the way I was living. If she found out what I was doing, oh, I'd be put out and I didn't want her to burn my clothes or put my stuff in the trash. So I kept all my stuff pretty much in my truck. And I told the woman on the phone that I met on Facebook, I said, well, look, I'm living with a dude and it's late and he's a rowdy guy. And he's, you know, walking around half dressed. So let me just get off the phone. I would make that excuse every time she FaceTimed me. And I began to know that she was smart enough to realize that something wasn't right, that something's not right about this picture. But I kept on lying. I didn't tell her that I was married. I didn't tell her that I was sleeping with another woman. I definitely didn't tell her I was living with one. And I didn't tell her about the drugs. But I kept on praying. And I remember that when I got in that wreck, two weeks later or so, about three weeks after I met her, I got into that wreck. I was able to juggle this relationship or friendship, if you will, because we weren't committed to, to one another, but we would talk a lot. 
I was able to juggle that and keep the truth from her. And when I got in that wreck and I hit my forehead on that on that dash, and I and I uh, woke up from the concussion, I remember the first thing God said to me was, "You need to get your life together, and you need to tell that woman the truth." I mean, why is that the first thing coming into my mind? Because God knew that she was about to make the decision to cut this relationship off completely because she knew that there were some lies in, in, in my story, but she was giving me a chance to make it right. She had respect for me and she was attracted to me, but she was not a fool and she wasn't going to continue going down that path, especially to uh, enter into a relationship built on lies. She had more sense than that. So when God said that to my mind that day, I remember I called the woman who I was living with. She came and picked me up because my truck was total. I couldn't drive it at all. And I didn't have insurance. And although the person who hit me was at fault, the state of Louisiana says that even if they are at fault, their insurance doesn't have to fix your vehicle if you don't have insurance. So I was pretty much screwed as a result of being irresponsible. Well, I called the woman that I was living with and I told her to come and pick me up. She did. She took me to her house and I began to start praying even more because remember the voice of God was talking to me. He spoke to me right after the wreck. I had been praying and he was beginning to start speaking and I was beginning to start wanting to listen. And so about another two weeks went by and I remember telling the young lady that I was living with from church, look, I, I can't do this anymore. I've got to move out. I'm sorry. Now there was the other woman that I was sleeping with. She was Mrs. Moneybag. She had bread. She had a brand new Mercedes Benz, her own condo. Uh, she had it going on. She was frugal and she knew how to manage her money. So I went to her and I said, look, I need to get $800 from you because I need to move out of my situation where I'm at, which she didn't know fully the details of. And I said, I need to move into, an, uh, into a hotel or something. And I found a hotel in Bossier City, Louisiana that would allow me to pay by the week. And I moved into that apartment. Uh, that hotel and uh, I felt an immediate sense of relief because now I'm where I need to be versus where I felt like I had to be. I'm where I need to be. I need to be by myself, a responsible man, paying my own bills and not tempted while women are walking around me half dressed or whatever in their home, right? Because me and the woman never had sex, but we did a whole lot of other things. I'm just going to leave it right there. Now was the situation with me and the woman I was sleeping with. And that was a sweet spot for me. She was gorgeous, although she was 25 years older than me. She had money. Almost every other week, she was spending three to $400 on clothes for me. So I had nothing. I didn't want to cut that off. But one day on the way out of town to Ruston, Louisiana, we were headed to the mall there um, to buy some clothes. She was going to buy me some stuff and take care of me, which she normally did. Uh, I remember the Holy Spirit said to my mind, you've been praying. You've started even now to start reading your Bible more. Remember I said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's Matthew 6, I was doing that. And although I was still caught up in some stuff, I was beginning to surrender and submit to God. And because I was reading my Bible and praying, no, I didn't stop doing all the drugs. No, I didn't stop all the sex. But I was beginning piece by piece to surrender and submit. And as we were headed back from Ruston, we had spent about $500 worth of monies on clothes for me, cologne, watches. Man, homegirl would take care of me. And right then, the Holy Spirit said, here is your chance. Let her know that this relationship is over. She was, I was driving, I would drive her car. And I looked over at her and I said, look, this relationship is over. I can't do this anymore. I can't have sex with you anymore. I can't see you anymore. You don't need to spend any more of your money on me. I'm not gonna come out and hang out with you. Nothing, cause she would buy me alcohol. I had a gallon of Crown Royal in her home. Whatever I wanted, I could have. Trust that the devil was preparing me for death. Because later on, I would find that my kidneys were failing. And had I lived in that situation and chose that situation over the situation that I have now, I would most likely be dead. Well, anyway, when I told her that I couldn't stay with her, she didn't fight it. She wasn't bitter. She wasn't angry. She said, pretty much, I knew that this day would come. She said, I knew that you were a special kind of person and that I only had you for a season. And that was it. There was no fighting, no bickering, no nothing. 
Now I could concentrate more completely on my relationship with God. But there again, there's the woman on Facebook, right? Because I was beginning to surrender and submit to God's voice, I was man enough to be able to tell her, look, I'm in the middle of a divorce. It's not quite final yet. It's almost final, but it's not quite final yet. I was man enough then and had enough spirit of God in me to tell her the truth about my living situation that I was living with a woman when we met and that I was sleeping with another woman while I was talking to her. I was able to tell her all the truth because if she was gonna love me, she would have to love me based on the truth and not a lie. And I told her these things and I said, look, for a season up until my divorce is final, we're gonna have to stop talking. We're gonna have to break free from one another. I'm gonna leave you in the hands of God. You leave me in the hands of God. We're gonna trust that if this is what God would have for us, that he will work it out. We're gonna go our separate ways and we'll just see how God takes care of things. And I let her go. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about my testimony. Revelation 12, 11 says that we will overcome Satan through the blood of the lamb and through the word of our testimony. I was living like a slob. I was living like a unrighteous man. I was unrighteous, sleeping around, doing drugs, everything in the book. But God began to honor my prayer. And as I began to pray, I would submit, I would surrender. Piece by piece, Rome was not built in a day. Don't let anybody tell you that as you're praying and asking God to come into your life, that he's not gonna begin to start working on you. Let God do the work. Too many preachers and teachers wanna do the work of changing folk. Let God do the work. You just direct that soul to prayer because that's what I was doing and it worked. And while I was getting myself together with God, my divorce eventually became final. I pick up the phone one day and I called that woman and I said, look, you have all the truth. You know it's everything that was going on in my life. If you still would like to get to know me, here I am. Brothers and sisters, we've been married for the last three years. My life has changed tremendously. I've never owned my own home. That's my house back there that you see behind me. I was always renting when I was married to my ex-wife. Now mind you, I destroyed a good marriage. I destroyed pretty much a good woman. And I am no longer there at home with my two children. I regret that. I'm not proud of that. Sin has consequences. But when you start praying and you start asking God to forgive you, and you start making changes and moving towards the right direction, God says that I will restore everything that Satan stole from you. Everything that you gave Satan, I'm going to give you back. I'm going to take care of you because I love you and I honor those who honor me. I've got a new car. My sister sold me a 2003 Toyota Sequoia, a beautiful vehicle. It runs. I ain't had to do no major repairs or nothing to this car. The air conditioning run cold. Yeah, I'm sitting in it right now. I have a three-bedroom house with a garage. Good garage. Yeah, I'm living good. I don't have to work. I work. My wife is a retired school teacher and she ain't old. She started early and retired in her 40s. Do you catch what I'm saying? Now, I look on the other side. And there's certain things that ain't going too good over there. Some folks still looking for a mate because they made decisions to do things the way they wanted to. Yeah, I'm not proud, but I'm happy. I'm grateful because if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, love, relationship will be added to you. Money, happiness will be added unto you. Joy, peace will be added unto you. My wife and I are preparing at some point in the near future to build our own church. We are gonna do great things. And people will know our names because they will know that we are the people that call on the name of Jesus. I ain't no, ain't no credit over here in my name. Ain't nothing good about me. When people know Andre Battles' name, it's because they'll know Andre Battles call on Jesus Christ. Right? Let me make that clear. I ain't full of myself. I know Jesus Christ is the reason why I'm alive. With a dialysis hose in my stomach 
and one leg that's been amputated, I know that Jesus is the reason why I'm still alive. So this is the extended version of one sure way as to how to gain yourself a mate. If you put first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he will add all of the things into your life. Hit the share button, subscribe, hit the bell, and you'll be blessed.